All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to announce the release of our latest report, Measuring the Promise of Transit-Oriented Development. First, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the report, which you should have access to via email if you registered in advance for this event. And we're putting the link in the chat as well. Then I'll introduce our esteemed speakers to tell you more about these issues from their perspectives. Please put any questions you have in the chat and we'll have time to answer them at the end. First of all, I want to explain the origins of this report. It's the end product of a two-year project in which Transform provided technical analysis and community engagement support for new TOD at several Bay Area rapid transit stations with a focus on the Lake Merritt and El Cerrito Plaza stations. While BART was the partner in the project itself, this report reflects Transform's independent analysis. A central theme of this report is to meet is, is, is that to meet the Bay Area's climate and affordability goals, we must prioritize housing over parking near high quality transit. Parking is surprisingly expensive to build. So there's a very real financial trade-off between building parking spaces or other benefits we urgently need, like more homes and amenities for residents and neighbors. Too much parking unnecessarily prioritizes driving over alternatives, which increases emissions that can cause health problems for people while feeding climate change. It undermines our transit ridership, our revenue and service provision, and it adds traffic to our roads. One of the key outcomes of the report was to quantify the collective benefits of developing bars urban with parking stations with the right size parking. Our analysis included, included the seven stations on this slide, Ashby, El Cerrito, Plaza, Fruitvale, Park, North Berkeley, Rockbridge, and San Leandro. The urban parking designation means that many passengers who start their trip to this station already get there by means other than driving. A chart on page 26 shows the collective performance of the de development scenarios. We model it at each of these stations with right size parking for BART patrons. Those scenarios would replace between zero and 30% of the BART patron parking currently at those stations. The column on the far left of the chart shows the collective performance of all the stations. In total, right sizing parking at these stations will make it possible to build almost 5,000 new homes, more than 2,000 of which could be below market rate. Those homes will generate two thirds less emissions and driving than the regional average for the Bay Area. These developments would attract nearly 7,000 new BART riders, supporting the financial viability of our transit system. And on average, 90% of the riders would get to these stations by a mode other than driving alone. That would be a 14% increase from pre COVID levels. The methodology in this report is not just applicable to BART and the Bay Area, all those designed to measure BART's particular TOD policy goals. The same principles can and should be applied to transit-oriented development anywhere else, as we'll hear from a similar number of freedmen in a moment. I also want to highlight the station access strategy section of the report, which showcases work that A wrote, a consultancy completed to analyze a number of improvements that can help people access stations by sustainable modes. The chart appears on page 31 of the report. Many of these strategies are outside the jurisdiction of BART. So this is one of the key roles cities have to play to enable TOD, transit-oriented development, that can reach its full potential. The other very important role of cities is to put policies in place to mitigate displacement as we welcome new residents. So I'm also going to move on to our speakers, but before I do that, I want to thank the author of the report, Nina Rizzo, who's on the call today and all the Transform staff who contributed to this work. I'd also like to thank our funders and project partners for their contributions to the entire project. Our speakers today are Assembly Member David Chu, Assembly Member Laura Friedman, BART Board Vice President Rebecca Saltzman, and Berkeley Mayor Jesse Ergen. Thank you all for joining us. We'll take questions after all of our speakers have given brief remarks. If you have a question, please put it in the chat at any time, and we'll call on you to ask at the end. Our first speaker, Assembly Member David, David Chu, 
authored the legislation that helped make this approach to TOD possible, AB 2923. Thank you, Assembly, Assembly Member. You may begin. Great, thank you so much, uh, Darnell and Transform. And I'm really pleased to be here today to help roll out Transform's new report on the incredible social and land use benefits of a kind of development that I think uh, in 2021, in the 21st century, we have to prioritize more than ever, which is transit-oriented development. A few years ago, I authored a bill in the State Assembly, AB 2923, which I thought was going to be a low-key common sense bill. Uh, to unlock the ability of one of our great public transit agencies to build more housing on parking lots that they already owned. So the context is BART has owned land around its BART stations, uh, about 250 or so acres around two dozen stations that at this moment have consisted for decades of about 95% parking lots. Parking lots that have sat empty every night. Uh, and over the past 49 years of BART's history, uh, BART, as well as Bay Area residents, we have and had hoped that we would be able to develop more housing next to the BART stations on top of these surface parking lots. And unfortunately, uh, for many decades, that had not been, uh, that had not come to fruition. And I just want to note, interestingly, BART actually already has had the authority to build additional transit facilities without more approvals, but before AB 2923 couldn't permit housing or mixed use development uh, by itself. Now it turned out uh, three years ago, this bill ended up becoming one of the most difficult and controversial bills that year, as uh, probably a number of speakers on today's panel can recall, but it was a significant victory to get it over the finish line. And I'm really thrilled to see Transform's report to outline its successes. Now AB 2923 was designed to address two twin crises facing the Bay Area in California, housing and affordability, and transportation congestion. And while we had seen some good mixed use development at BART in the past, the process for delivering new great communities at our most accessible transit stations was mostly broken prior to the passage of this bill. Before AB 2923, we would see protracted local fights pitting neighbors against neighbors, advocacy organizations, and local electeds against each other. And as a result, we saw mostly stalemate and inaction. And when projects actually did move forward, they took decades. Uh, there were some projects that got bogged down for literally 10, 20, or 30 years. We saw local conversations often swallowed up by narrow discussions about height and parking and setbacks, rather than productive collaborations to deliver diverse, walkable, safe, and sustainable places we need around BART stations. And we saw jurisdictions frequently demand less housing and more parking at these sites. And why I'm excited about this report is because it proves that this bill, AB 2923, actually did result in more collaboration, more resources, faster delivery, and better development, and some of the most important development sites in the Bay Area and in the state. And by prioritizing transit-oriented, walkable, mixed-use, and mixed-income housing, within steps of our BART stations, this measure is increasing housing supply, reducing traffic congestion, and cutting greenhouse gas emissions in a very quantifiable and efficient way. And it's gonna keep doing so until we literally have tens of thousands of new housing units and new affordable units in the works and being made available to residents. Now, I wanna just take a moment and thank so many individuals who helped push AB 29 and 23 over the finish line. And I hope all of you see this report as validation of our vision. And I wanna give particular kudos to BART and its leadership. And I know we're gonna hear shortly from uh, the vice chair of the BART board, Rebecca Saltzman. I also wanna thank, I know Janice Lee, from the BART uh, board is on, as well as other BART leadership. I want to thank the many local electeds that engage with us. And I see the Berkeley mayor, just want to thank uh, Jesse. Thank you for your leadership of ABAG and for your engagement on this. Um, it really did take many, many villages to move this forward. And of course, Transform was part of this all the way. You know, it's going to take all of us to move forward this vision of livable, sustainable communities. And you can rest assured there are 
many of us in the legislature that want to take this on, and most notably our next speaker. I'm really excited uh, to uh, to uh, help to introduce a colleague of mine who, while she may be an LA Dodgers fan, uh, is an incredible, incredible champion, both for housing and for transit. She was recently appointed as the new chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee. And I have told Assembly Member Freeman that I would love to bring her to the Bay, particularly now that uh, our masks are coming off to meet the incredible transit and housing leaders in the Bay, uh, because she now has has uh, leadership authority over so many policies that will be incredibly important to us. Uh, but it's my honor to uh, to welcome Assemblymember Freeman and just say again, thank you to all of you. And I look forward to moving forward this vision of transit oriented development. And I want to apologize that in a few minutes, I have another uh, press commitment I've got to jump to. Uh, so if anyone has questions, feel free. Uh, and you need to reach me, feel free to reach out to me directly. But in the meantime, looking forward to our work together in this space. And with that, Chairman Freeman. Thank you, David. Uh, it's been really a privilege to be able to work with David um, and to see his leadership uh, with all things housing and sustainability in the legislature. He is really one of the people that I rely on. We rely on each other to push progressive policies forward in this space. And I wanna thank Transform for inviting me to be here today. So for the past couple of years, I've chaired the Natural Resources Committee in the assembly. And since I've been in the assembly starting in 2016, I focused on uh, sustainability and climate. Uh, as the mom of a, as of today, eight-year-old, um, the thing that I worry about most and that keeps me awake at night is the planet that she's going to, to inherit and inhabit. And we see, you know, it's, I, it's supposed to be 109 degrees today in Sacramento. And uh, uh, where I live down in Los Angeles, uh, some of the area, parts of Los Angeles are 106 degrees today. And, you know, this is all related to climate and we are rapidly moving into um, a, a place where our, large parts of our planet are becoming uninhabitable. We see climate refugees, and this is the biggest crisis that is, is facing mankind probably since we started picking up and using tools. So this is something that we all should be focused on. So in natural resources, you know, what I, what I was able to, to see was that California has really been a world leader when it comes to sustainability uh, and climate in terms of our regulations on um, polluters, our air quality regulations, and so many other areas, and yet, there's one area that has been a very stubborn outlier in California, and that's transportation, which has moved in the wrong direction with increasing emissions over the years, um, even in the more recent years, with somewhere around 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions coming from our transportation sector. And yes, we are rapidly moving towards electric vehicles, and we have a very visionary governor with Governor Newsom, who has very aspirational uh, clean car uh, and clean freight um, goals. And yet we know that even under the best scenario, that's not going to come anywhere fast enough to really save us. And it's also true that many of the other effects of transportation are not from tailpipes. A lot of the, the problems of transportation have to do with um, land use and the way that we have overemphasized cars in our built environment. So much of our environment is paved um, which causes a heat island effect, which causes us to live further and further apart from each other, which leads to so many things. And when it comes to parking, that has really been one of the, the tail that wags the dogs with uh, approximately uh, two parking spaces for every person in Los Angeles. The estimates uh, across the country are that we dedicate approximately a thousand square feet for every car uh, of real estate, permanent real estate, but only 800 square feet of real estate for every person in terms of housing. So that shows you that we have prioritized cars over people, not just in California, but nationwide. And that includes areas that probably have lower parking requirements than we have in many of our California cities. Um, the estimate is that we have around 400 square miles of paved land just for parking in the county of Los Angeles, uh, larger than, than the city of San Francisco and, and several of the Bay Area uh, cities put together. Uh, the result of this are cities that are not walkable, not bikeable, where people are forced to drive even to get a, a gallon of milk at night. I have to go a, a, over a half a mile myself and I'm close to some of our commercial areas where I live. Um, and certainly when it comes to safety, you know, going back to children again, the leading cause of death for children is auto accidents. So there are a lot of reasons um, beyond um, just 
tailpipe emissions that we need to think about parking in a different way. And we need to think about these issues in a more holistic way and take them out of their silos. Uh, emissions and housing and transportation are all parts of the same issue. And they all come back to the way we use land and the way that we think about land use. Um, we know that, that public health outcomes are bad when people spend more time driving than they do walking and biking. We know that diabetes is on the rise. Dialysis centers are on the rise. All of this has to do with a sedentary lifestyle and what we've created through the way that we use land. So we need to think bigger and we need to think about connecting all of these issues. And every single reason that people have why we should continue to have unsustainable parking requirements are easily overcome with better planning. Everything from running better transit and creating better transit and making those investments to using land in a way that allows people to walk and bike within 15 minutes to where they work and where they buy their groceries and where they recreate. These are all solvable problems that also have co-benefits, not just of, a, of sustainability, but of public health and co-benefits of connecting communities so that people look their neighbors in the eye and get to know them uh, personally rather than just drive past them um, you know, at 35 miles an hour. Every single benefit of removing parking requirements and prioritizing people and communities uh, is real and tangible and we see it all around the world in the cities that we all like to visit. And we also have case studies in terms of cities that have removed parking requirements. Cities like San Diego, now Berkeley, San, uh, San Francisco, and Buffalo, New York, uh, interestingly enough, which removed parking requirements and found that no, uh, developers didn't just stop building parking, they right-sized parking requirements. And then they also got more creative about how they used those resources like parking structures. So the bill that I've introduced, AB 1401, says that within a half a mile of a high quality transit corridor, there could no longer be any parking requirements for commercial or residential developments. It allows for developers to work together. It allows for the market uh, to right size uh, developments. It allows for residential housing developments to be able to build more missing middle housing and offer units with maybe tandem parking, maybe one spot, maybe no spots to people who want to pay less for those units because maybe they don't have a car or they have one car. So it, it, it begins to allow for that transformation of the way that we use land to hopefully a more sustainable and healthier models that are also better for neighbor making and for our society. I wanna thank Transform for shining a spotlight on these issues. I'm gonna stick around as long as I can to answer any questions. And, um, you know, David, uh, thank you so much for being a great partner. All right, thank you very much uh, to both of our esteemed assembly members uh, for your leadership. We really appreciate the work that you're doing in Sacramento to represent all of us and to improve our state and really combat climate change uh, as uh, Assembly Member Friedman mentioned. Uh, next, we're very pleased to have BART Board Vice President Rebecca Salzman with us. She has been a champion for transit-oriented development at BART throughout her nearly 10 years on the BART Board of Directors. Thank you, Director. Uh, you may begin. Thank you so much, Darnell. Transform's report shows how much is at stake as we decide how to develop BART's property. These decisions impact the affordability and livability of our communities, our climate, and the future of our transit transportation system. The areas around BART stations have the potential to be vibrant communities where people can live close to transit, shops, and restaurants. New development can bring new amenities that communities want, like libraries, parks, and streets that are safer for people. And I'm so proud of how BART's transit-oriented development policy goals move us in this direction, particularly our goal around affordability that 35% of the homes on BART property system-wide will be below market rate. We, of course, all have a role in play, to play in addressing the housing affordability crisis, and we're now at a make or break point for BART's affordability goals. We must maximize the affordable units at each development to be able to reach 35% affordable units system-wide. The report makes clear that the degree to which we can realize the benefits of transit-oriented development whether it's affordable homes, new community amenities, reduced traffic, more people taking transit and biking and walking, relates directly to the degree to which we can adapt to having less parking at these locations. It's an issue of cost and space, but it's really a question about our priorities for our communities. Many people already bike, walk, take transit, or carpool to BART, 
and even more could do so with access improvements like those described in the report, including transit improvements, upgrades to the bike and pedestrian network, and, and building more bike stations at BART. I'm not endorsing the specific replacement parking numbers in the report, but I strongly support the idea that we must right-size parking and choose to prioritize homes, affordability, and the climate. My home community around the El Cerrito Plaza BART station and the community I represent in North Berkeley are in the midst of planning for housing and grappling with the issues of parking and access. And similar conversations are starting soon in Rockridge. As I try to bring as much information, compassion and vision to my neighbors and constituents as possible, this report is, is one of the inputs that will help us clarify the choices before us. Finally, I want to encourage other transit agency leaders to look closely both at this report and at BART's transit-oriented development policies and consider the best uses of the land near your stations. As the assembly members have said, this is incredibly important for our future and we're going to all need to work together to address both the affordability and climate crisis. Thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, for your leadership as well. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Janice Lee, Board, BART Director from San Francisco. Uh, she's in the audience as well. Uh, our final speaker is Berkeley Mayor Jesse Arreguin, who also serves as President of the Association of Bay Area Governments. Mayor Arreguin and the City of Berkeley have been out in front on parking reform, eliminating parking minimums in most of the city earlier this year. Two Berkeley BART stations will be seeing more homes with less driving in the next few years. So he's very familiar with this process and the role of city government within it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You may begin. Well, thank you so much to Transform for this report highlighting the benefits of transit oriented development at our BART stations. And I want to thank BART also for its commitment to sustainable development. This is a policy that goes back several decades. And Director Saltzman talked about. Um, BART's long range plan for building housing around a number of its stations in the San Francisco Bay Area with an emphasis on affordability. And I really think that public land, including land owned by our transit stations, presents the best opportunity to create affordable and sustainable neighborhoods. I want to thank Assemblymember Chu for his leadership in passing Assembly Bill 2923 and thank Assemblymember Friedman for introducing AB 1401 this session which will help us right size parking requirements at transit stations and in transit rich areas. And, um, you know, in Berkeley, we have two large parking lots um, around two of our transit stations at Ashby and North Berkeley Station. And the, the parking lot at Ashby Station um, was a result of a very long fight with the South Berkeley community and BART over whether to build tracks um, uh, that would literally divide our city. And the community fought that project and worked to raise the, raise the money to underground the BART tracks because they did not want the BART tracks to divide our community. But that led to um, the demolition of an, many homes um, in South Berkeley um, and, and led to um, uh, the displacement of residents in South Berkeley. And so I really do believe that building um, a, a sustainable um, housing at our Ashby station really presents an opportunity for us to heal the wounds that were created by the development that happened in the 1960s to reverse the effects of urban renewal and to um, address what I think is one of our greatest challenges facing our region and our state, our housing affordability crisis. At North Berkeley Station, we have large expansive asphalt that could be um, the site for um, up to 1400 homes. And so we know that we need to prioritize um, uh, housing for people and not cars. And building housing close to our transit stations not only reduces vehicle miles traveled, um, but it will also create a vibrant, sustainable communities. Um, it will help improve the fiscal health of our transit stations, which are rebounding after a devastating pandemic. It will also reduce vehicle miles traveled and help us address our climate crisis. And we have a great opportunity, and this is highlighted in the report, to create um, sustainable livable neighborhoods of affordable homes throughout, um, throughout our region at our various BART stations, including in Berkeley, El Cerrito, um, San Francisco, and many parts of the region, to create close to 5,000 new units, including 2,000 below market rate units. And uh, in Berkeley, you know, we have been working with BART in partnership to plan 
uh, for transit-oriented development. Our BART stations, even before Assembly Bill 2923 was adopted, um, we have uh, we launched and we're in the middle of an extensive community process um, to develop zoning to implement 2923 um, and to help develop a vision and priorities for new development at our BART stations. Um, and I really do believe that cities can be partners with BART through adopting progressive pro-housing sustainable transportation policies. We need to right-size parking near transit. That's why in Berkeley, we adopted legislation to um, eliminate parking minimums and establish parking maximums. And we think that will help us get cars off the road, invest in um, transit and, and alternatives, reduce VMT and address our climate crisis. We need to address the displacement and gentrification crisis through building housing, particularly housing that's affordable for low and very low income households. Uh, we need to improve station access um, and, um, uh, you know, put in bike and pedestrian infrastructure to improve connectivity to our BART stations. We need to establish uh, first and last mile options to get people to and from our BART stations, um, to get people out of their cars and to address our gro growing climate emergency. And we need to do this all by working with our local community. And I really think the vision that's outlined here um, in this report is a good roadmap for not just Berkeley, but for cities throughout the Bay Area as we're beginning to implement Assembly Bill 2923 and plan for what I think is an exciting opportunity to address our regional housing crisis. So thank you to Transform and happy to answer questions. All right, thank you very much, Mayor Aragin, and to all of our speakers. We now have time for questions and we'll prioritize questions from reporters first. Uh, this will be facilitated by uh, Communications Director for Transform, Edie Irons. Hi everybody, thanks for being here. Um, and also we know that Mayor Aragin may have to leave um, in about five minutes. Uh, so if there's any questions for him, we'll prioritize that as well. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I haven't seen any from reporters. Um, please do put them in the chat if you, um, if you have any. Um, but uh, let's start off uh, with a question from Mark Molino. And Mark, uh, I'm going to unmute you if you want to go ahead and ask your question. You're welcome to. OK, sounds good. Uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, for your work. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. Love the report. And uh, yeah, I think it's very uh, I love seeing uh, the stress on the importance of recapturing value uh, from BART lands. Uh, but my question is, uh, what thoughts do you all have on striking a balance between using value recaptured from the current BART lands versus the possibility of using a portion of these streams to acquire additional lands to create a virtuous cycle of uh, of, of more recapture? Uh, just uh, yeah, basically land acquisition. Uh, what 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 kind of role could this could this play? And Director Salzman, do you want to start off with that one? Thank you. Yeah, happy to. You know, it's it's not part of our strategy at the moment. The reality is, even if we wanted to, uh, the properties around BART stations are some of the most high value properties in the Bay Area, and that's because they're next to BART stations. Um, so to just acquire more land would be incredibly expensive. Um, maybe if this had been done decades ago, it would have made sense. But at this point, it doesn't really make sense. Every once in a while, we'll acquire a small, tiny piece of land that's adjacent, that's really underused, that some private property owner owns but doesn't really use. Um, so small parcels, and we'll do the reverse as well. But in terms of large amounts of property acquisition, that is not planned right now. And our planners have plenty of work to do with the properties that we own. Would anybody else like to speak to that or should we move to the next question? Okay. Um, next question is from Derek Sagehorn. It's about uh, Link 21. Derek, uh, I'm looking for you to unmute you if you wanna go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Derek Sagehorn from East Bay Transit Riders Union. Um, I just wanted to see, um, ask staff, ask um, Bart if you know if this report can or how can this report inform um, 
BART and Capital Corridors Link 21 process in terms of new TOD and value capture going forward. Thanks. Anybody want to take that one? Darnell, do you want to maybe say what Link 21 is all about for starters? Sure. Um, so um, it's a suite of projects which really uh, encompasses the full breadth of, of transportation needs for the Northern California mega region. So it stretches from Placer County down to the Bay Area. Uh, so it's a suite of projects meant to really uh, make it easier to commute and travel uh, within that mega region. Um, a lot of the emphasis has been on the projects that are directly uh, impacting uh, the Bay, particularly the, the possibility of a new uh, link between uh, the East Bay and San Francisco. Um, that's, the, that's what Link 21 is. Um, ter in terms of the question, I think, um, you know, there, there's definitely an ability to uh, do additional housing near the stations that pop up from this project. So it could promote our affordability aims as a region to lower our, our housing costs and transportation costs for residents. It also could uh, influence uh, our ability to uh, reduce the impacts of uh, climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so there's some positive outcomes that could come from investment in Link 21 uh, uh, as a suite of projects. Jesse or Rebecca, any, either of you want to comment on Link 21? Okay, I'll just say it's not every day we get the opportunity to actually create new places for transit-oriented development. So uh, it's, it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, Melanie Curry with Streets Blog has the next question, and uh, I'm looking for you to help you unmute. Go ahead, Melanie. Hi, thanks. I was just wondering if somebody can talk about what the next steps are of from this report and with the plans at the various stations for BART. I can say with this report, we're excited to get it out into the into the world for starters. Um, Darnell, you could speak more to that, or Rebecca or Jesse um, could maybe speak to the next steps for BART. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have a garbage truck outside my house, so apologies if there's there's noise. Um, so in terms of next steps for BART, um, this is actually report is very well timed. I don't think this was on purpose by transform but the BART board at our next meeting don't quote me on this but I think the date is the 24th but the next BART board meeting we're going to be having a discussion about parking at transit oriented development projects focusing on the next ones coming up which are North Berkeley Ashby and El Cerrito Plaza and just discussing these trade-offs that exist um, not any vote there but it's an informational item and then we will have a vote, you know, later on in the year about the parking at some of these stations. Um, we are also undergoing community processes in, uh, well, we have a, a process along the whole corridor from uh, Ashby up to El Cerrito Plaza. We're looking at the whole corridor because we understand that if we're developing all these stations around the same time, um, people who might have just started parking at one of the other stations, that's not going to be an option anymore. So we really have to address the access needs all together. Um, and somebody who might have been driving before to North Berkeley might actually have a bus that could take them to downtown Berkeley. So they might be using a different station altogether. So that study is underway and there's a community process underway and there will be several virtual public meetings this summer uh, mainly aimed at uh, El Cerrito, Berkeley, and surrounding residents who use these stations. Um, so we're we're doing that process, and that will help us inform, you know, how many parking spaces we need to build at each station. But we're doing this in a very data-driven way, really looking at how people use the stations now and how they could use them in the future, um, so that we don't overbuild parking and and sacrifice some of the other things we need, like affordable housing.
Go ahead, Mayor Again. Mm -hmm. um, I also say that this report is well timed as uh, we are having discussions with BART and within the Berkeley community around, you know, how much replacement parking should we require at these two stations? And um, there are trade offs. Um, you know, the more parking we require on site, the less units we're going to build, the less affordable housing we can build, the more, um, on the less depth of affordability that we can actually create at these stations. And we've heard a great, um, a great need for maximizing affordable housing at these two locations, because these really are the best sites that we have in Berkeley to build transit oriented development. But we can't maximize affordability and maximize parking. That's just not gonna work from an economic feasibility standpoint. So I think the support and the methodology it puts forward and the case studies do provide useful examples um, and policy tools for us to use as we are having these important conversations in Berkeley and I know other communities are having in the Bay Area um, to balance um, these various different needs. Um, we do, in North Berkeley, we have uh, many people that commute from um, the Berkeley Hills down to the station. How are we gonna get people to that location? So we have to balance all these different needs, but uh, there's no question that currently having large expanses of asphalt um, and surface level parking is not the best use of that space. Thank you. That is really what it comes down to. Um, I have a question for assembly member Friedman, um, wondering just, you know, a lot of this conversation is, is centered on the Bay area, but it really does apply throughout the state and your bill AB 1401 would, um, would kind of bring the rest of the state up to where this conversation is. What is um, sticking out for you um, as you hear the conversation? Well, I think that uh, just the same questions that the Bay Area is facing with the BART stations um, that other agencies should be thinking about statewide. Uh, I haven't heard the conversation so much in Los Angeles with, you know, with their transit. Uh, and I'd like to hear more of that. I'd like to hear more agencies who recognize that there are real trade-offs with offering a lot of parking and that the convenience that we feel we're offering people is much better offered in different ways. And that um, there's a real under, uh, there's very little recognition of the harm that all of this parking is doing, um, you know, in, for so many, in so many different aspects. You know, the other thing I'll say is the other, uh, thing that we haven't really thought about in all of this is is autonomous vehicles and what that's going to do to the need for parking at all and you know that's it's here and it's coming and these uh this planning that we're doing now is long term these projects aren't going to be built for many years uh even if we started them tomorrow they still have a you know a several year uh, build out time and by that time we might be looking back we might be tearing those very same parking structures down and there's a huge um uh cost to that both financially and environmentally. Great point. Darnell, did you wanna add anything or speak to the last point? Absolutely, a um, couple of things. One, I think uh, really focusing on reducing parking near high quality transit is going to benefit the working class in our state. Uh, and the region that decides to take this up will be a, a, a kind of a harbinger was possible uh, going forward people oftentimes drive until they qualify. Uh, that means they have a long commutes because that's where they can actually afford to live. There's much more demand for housing near high quality transit that has walkability and the ability to ride or, uh, or, or walk um, uh, than uh, people actually have access to. So to really be equitable and provide opportunity to all of our residents in the state, we need to really focus on building more near transit, which means reducing this parking. Uh, we actually have a lot of parking near transit that is unnecessary. Indeed, and I think that um, is probably a wrap. I don't see any more questions coming in the chat. This is the last call if there's any other questions. If not. In that case, um, just want to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us this morning. I know many people who are with us today played some role in the course of this project, so I want to thank all of you and for your interest and commitment to these important issues. I hope this event was informative and that you find the report useful. Look out for a post about the report on social media today and please share them and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
Thanks, everybody.